Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath school lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series that we start today is on the book of Daniel. And this will be the lesson then for January 4 of 2020, the very first lesson in the series. And this lesson is entitled, From Reading to Understanding. Now that's a big challenge, isn't it? Reading to understanding. What does that mean? Well, let's get started. And as usual, we'd like to start with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we've come now to an important part of Scripture, a part that has been very controversial and challenging to people's understanding. Help us to see through the various things that we read and understand the meaning that you want us to gain is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you have been around the Seventh-day Adventist Church for any number of years, you'll recognize that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has distinguished itself in the past by their bold interpretations of the book of Daniel. William Miller's discovery of the interpretation of Daniel 8.14 and its related passages in Daniel 9 started the Advent movement in New England in the 1820s and 1830s. It would be fun if we had time to go back and review that history, but we don't. So what should, we, what should or does the book of Daniel mean to us in 2020 now? Consider the following points. All of Scripture, one, all of Scripture, including the book of Daniel, is centered on the truth about God and specifically the role of Jesus Christ in the plan of salvation. Two, the organization of the book of Daniel is designed to show the major focus on God's sovereignty and actions in humans' lives. And that's going to be a major point. We're going to need to focus on it. Three, in this lesson we will focus on understanding the differences between classical prophecies and apocalyptic prophecies. The kind of prophecies we see in the book of, books of Daniel and Revelation are known as apocalyptic prophecies. They're quite different from the prophecies primarily regarding the children of Israel as outlined in places like Isaiah, Amos, and Jeremiah, um, and many other parts of the Old Testament, starting from Moses, I might add. It should be clear from even a superficial reading of the book of Daniel that it involves long time periods and huge changes in events on this earth, changes in empires and all sorts of stuff. This necessitates understanding what we call the year-day or the day-year principle. Even though Daniel focuses on major world events, changes in world empires, etc., the total impact has a direct effect on our personal lives even today. And we're going to try to figure out how that is true. Notice these words from Jesus himself in Luke 24, 25 to 37, 27, I'm sorry. Then Jesus said to them, how foolish you are. Now this is Jesus talking to those two disciples, although they're not, not one of the two of the twelve. They were walking from, from Jerusalem to Emmaus on the evening of the resurrection. How foolish you are, how slow you are to believe everything the prophet said. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and then to enter his glory? And Jesus explained to them what was said about himself and all the scriptures beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. So how much does that include? Pretty much everything, yeah, right, in scripture? Bible. Yes. The whole Bible. In John 5, 39, you study the scriptures, Jesus said to the Pharisees, because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very scriptures speak about me. And what scriptures did they have available in the days of Jesus? The Old, Old Testament. Testament. Only the Old Testament. So, and then 2 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20 says something similar. These three key passages in the New Testament point out very clearly that the truth about God is lived out in the life and death of Jesus Christ is the center point of the Bible and of the history of salvation. So, how could that possibly be to apply to a book like the book of Daniel? Jackie, I think you and Dennis have some words about that. Well... There is no question that Jesus is central to the scriptures, and this includes Daniel as well. For example, chapter 1 shows that although in a limited and imperfect way, 
that Daniel's experience is analogous to that of Christ, who left heaven to live in this sinful world and confront the powers of darkness. Moreover, Daniel and his companions are endowed from above with Christ-like wisdom to face the challenges of the Babylonian culture. Chapter 2 describes the figure of the end-time eschatological stone to indicate that the kingdom of Christ will eventually replace all the kingdoms of the world. Chapter 3 reveals Christ walking with his faithful servants within a furnace of fire. Chapter 4 shows God removing Nebuchadnezzar from his kingdom for a period of time so that the king could understand that heaven rules. The expression heaven rules reminds us that Christ, as the Son of Man, receives the dominion and the kingdom as depicted in Daniel 7. Dennis? Chapter 5 shows the demise of King Belshazzar and the fall of Babylon to the Persians during a night of revelry and debauchery. This foreshadows the defeat of Satan and the ob obliteration obliteration of end-time Babylon by Christ and his angels. Chapter 6 shows the plot against Daniel in ways that resemble the false accusations voiced against Jesus by the other, other priests. Moreover, as King Darius unsuccessfully tries to spare Daniel, Pilate unsuccessfully tries to spare Jesus, Matthew 27, verses 17 to 24. Chapter 7 depicts Christ as the Son of Man receiving the kingdom and reigning over his people. Chapter 8 shows Christ as a priest of the heavenly, uh, uh, a priest of the heavenly sanctuary. Chapter 9 portrays Christ as a sacrificial victim whose death reconfirms the covenant between God and his people. And chapters 10 through 12 present Christ as Michael, the commander-in-chief, who fights the forces of evil and victoriously rescues God's people, even from the power of death. It's from the Adult Bible School, uh, Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, December 29. Wow. So you might recognize there that those are not clearly, clearly not direct prophecies of what happened in the life of Christ. But it is clear that there are parallels, interesting parallels between these stories in the book of Daniel and the life of Christ. So, question for you. When you think about the book of Daniel, do you think about the miraculous stories of rescue from the burning fiery furnace and the lion's den, the stories that we teach our kids? Or do you think about statues of different metals and beasts with strange shapes? Is it clear in your mind that all of these teach us something about Jesus Christ? Well, the late uh, Dr. Leslie Harding, uh, his take was that the the, uh, the vision. Let's see the the stories. Well, the visions tell about the time of the end and when that's going to be, and the stories tell us how to live in the time of the end. So that's just another way of, yeah. of kind of looking at it. I can tell you that. Uh, we're going to find out as we work our way through Daniel that people have interpreted Daniel in so many crazy ways. It's just unbelievable. Of course, many so-called biblical scholars today don't believe that it's possible even for God to predict the future. So if God can't predict the future, then you have to somehow figure out how to manipulate the book of Daniel so that it's all history. So they think somebody wrote it in the days of the um, Maccabees and just claimed it was written by Daniel. Well, there's all sorts of reasons why that can't be true, but uh, many people still believe it. So we're gonna, we'll, we'll work on those things as we work our way through the book of Daniel. Well, the book of Daniel is also written in two different languages. In the days of Daniel, it was expected that any Hebrew would speak his own native language, but he would also speak the required national language called Aramaic, the language of Nebuchadnezzar and his government. In fact, you were forbidden from speaking your own language. You weren't supposed to do that. Everybody was supposed to speak Aramaic. And so, as time went by, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, completely changed over to speaking Aramaic. So, Aramaic was the language of Jesus. 
So the book of Daniel is divided into the following ways. Daniel 1, 1 through 2, 4 is written in Hebrew. But then Daniel 2, 4 through Daniel 7, 28, which primarily deals with the kings and the emperors and so forth like that, is in Aramaic. Then Daniel 8 through 12, which is primarily talking to the Jewish people again, is again in Hebrew. Aramaic and Hebrew are sister languages, something like the way Spanish and Portuguese uh, are related to each other. So look, at, there's a very interesting pattern if we take just those Aramaic portions of the book of Daniel in the middle, very interesting pattern on in how they, they fit. And now, Margaret, I think you have something about yeah, that. Yeah, look at the organization of the Aramaic portions of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar's vision of the four kingdoms, Daniel 2. God delivers Daniel's companions from the fiery furnace, Daniel 3. Judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar is Daniel 4, and judgment upon Belshazzar is Daniel 5. God delivers Daniel from the den of lions, his chapter is Daniel 6. And Daniel's vision of the four kingdoms, Daniel 7. And this is from the Adult Sabbath School Guide from Monday, December 30. Yeah. So we see that there's, there's a, it goes in, t and then it turns around and comes back out. Parallel things. And so what is the main point? Well, there are many places in the scripture where messages are organized, as you see in this chiasm. It's called a chiasm because the Greek letter which looks like an X, is called a key or a chai, and so they, it's named after that. So the most important parts of the messages are in the middle. In modern times, we often save the most important parts of a story for the ending, but that was not what they did in ancient times. So looking at the chiasm, it is clear that the most important parts of the book of Daniel are the emphasis on God's sovereignty over the empires and kings of this world and his ability to establish them or remove them when necessary. Now, obviously, people who are big into time prophecies and so forth like that might not agree that those are the most important parts, but there's certainly an important point to be made about that issue. In many ancient languages, also, a way of emphasizing something is by repeating it. Think of the dreams of Pharaoh that were interpreted by Joseph as recorded in Genesis 41, 1-7. We don't have time to read that, but remember that there were the cows, and then there were the heads of grain, and it was doubled. Everything was doubled. So when we come to the book of Daniel, we find out that there are four sets of prophecies that are quite similar, each one repeating portions of the previous one and adding some details. So see the chart below, and if you look in our handout, and by the way, our handouts are available to you if you want to use them in your Sabbath school classes. Uh, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And you can look up and, and get this handout. But you can see we have Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and 9, and Daniel 10 through 12. Those are the four major prophecies in the book of Daniel. And we see that in Daniel 2 we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then God's kingdom is established by that stone being cut out of the mountain and just completely grinding all these other kingdoms to, little, to, to pieces. Then we turn to Daniel 7, and lo and behold, there it is, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome again, and it ends up saying there's a heavenly judgment that leads to a new earth, somewhat similar. And then we turn to Daniel 8 and 9. Now Babylon is no longer in power. It's been overthrown by Medo-Persia. So we drop down, we pick out, it goes Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then the purification of the sanctuary, or the sanctuary to be cleansed. And then Daniel um, 10, and, uh, 10 through 12, again, same story. It's Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Michael stands up saying that the uh, time of the end had come. So we see here that in the book of Daniel, we have four pretty much parallel prophecies, and what do you suppose that means to us? If you have four things almost talking about the same thing. Well, there's an emphasis placed on these prophecies. Absolutely. And it, we, we pick up a little additional information in each, in each set or each prophecy so we can add to the total picture that we have there. So how about that? Does it give you hope to recognize that God has been in charge from ancient times until our day?
Yeah. Does it give you hope to know that Daniel 2 states that a great stone will be carved out of the mountain and will strike the kings of the, uh, kingdoms of this earth, completely destroying them, and that Jesus Christ will be the future and eternal king of this world? And that's, of course, that famous verse in Daniel 2, 44. Let's look at that for a moment. At the time of these rulers, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never end. It will never be conquered, but will completely destroy all of those empires and then last forever. So here we have four kingdoms, world powers, and they go one and then it's succeeded by another, by another, by another. And then, you know, you would think if you were just a human trying to guess, you would say, well, there's probably going to be another kingdom and it's going to be replaced by another one and it's going to be replaced by another one. No, God says there will never again be a, an, a world ruling power until Jesus himself comes back and establishes the eternal kingdom which will never end. And guess what? It all worked out exactly the way Daniel prophesied. Amazing. I wonder how he managed to do that. Hmm. Well, you can read other passages, many of them in scriptures talk about how God will come and he will rule Psalm 9, verses 7 to 12, as one mentioned in 2 Peter 3, 11 to 13. So now, w one of the other major things that we want to discover as we read this lesson and when compare Daniel with other kinds of prophecies are two different kinds of prophecy. And I think, Kara, you have something about that. Yes. Let us now look at the differences between classical and apocalyptic prophecy. Apocalyptic prophecies display some peculiar features that differentiate them from the so-called classical prophecies. Firstly, visions and dreams. In apocalyptic prophecy, God uses mainly dreams and visions to convey his message to the prophet. In classical prophecy, the prophet receives, quote, the word of the Lord, unquote, which can include visions, an expression that occurs with slight variations about 1,600 times in the classical prophets. Then we come to composite symbolism. While in classical prophecy there is a limited amount of symbolism, mainly involving symbols that are true to life, in apocalyptic prophecy God shows symbols and imagery beyond the world of human reality, such as hybrid animals or monsters with wings and horns. And clearly those are... Think about how many times we've seen people holding series of meetings and you see these strange beasts yeah. up there and people, what's all that? You know, it, it, it grabs attention for a little while anyway. Then we come to divine sovereignty and unconditionality. In contrast to classical prophecies whose fulfillment is often dependent on human response in the context of God's covenant with Israel, apocalyptic prophecies are unconditional. In apocalyptic prophecy, God reveals the rise and fall of world empires from Daniel's day to the end of time. This kind of prophecy rests on God's foreknowledge and sovereignty and will happen regardless of human choices. Now that's a really important point. This apocalyptic prophecy is going to say this kingdom is going to be replaced and it's not you know, whether or not they repent or something else like this. It's, it's going to happen. Yeah. And then finally that rock is going to be cut out and it's going to destroy all the kings of the earth and Jesus is going to come and he's going to rule. It's going to happen. There's no, no, you know, well maybe if you pant or something will be different. No, none of that. So let's talk about a traditional classic prophecy. What happened with Jonah? Jonah 3 verses 3 to 10, what was his message to, jo to Nineveh? Repent, and or, or you will be destroyed. Yep. Five words. Repent, or you will be destroyed. It's like that. Shortest prophetic message probably in the whole Bible. Well, he came, and you know, he preached around to, to Nineveh, and they repented. Yeah. And so God changed his mind. Amazing. That's a traditional prophecy, but... Compare or contrast Daniel 7, verses 6. While I was watching, another beast appeared. It looked like a leopard, but on its back there were four wings, like the wings of a bird, and, and it had four heads. And it, it had a look of authority about it. 
Now you've all seen those in these local zoos, right? <laughs> no, that's a strange creature that obviously is meant to symbolize something, whatever. We're going to figure it out eventually, but that's not the kind of animal you'd go to the zoo to see. So clearly Daniel 7, 6 is a different kind of prophecy than the one that Jonah gave to the people of Nineveh. We can learn several important things from comparing these two types of prophecy. God used many in various ways. Jim, I think you got something on that. May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay. I'm sorry. You need you to jump ahead there. I jumped ahead. Let me let me let me God has used many in various ways to communicate to human beings. And that's Hebrews one one. Understanding the differences between classical and apocalyptic prophecy will help us to understand not only the complexity of the Bible, but also its beauty as well. This knowledge will also help us to interpret biblical prophecy with the context in the local the Bible rightly explaining the word of truth. So, if, if these prophecies can be interpreted correctly, then the Jewish people who could read the original language, they should know the answers, right? They should. <laughs> they should. And they have taken very interesting approaches to the book of Daniel. And Jim Beck, you can tell us what is some Hebrew Orthodox Hebrew scholars have said about the book of Daniel. May the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time. And may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. Talmudic law. Yeah, wow. So why would they say that about one of their... I mean, this book is preserved in their Bible. So what's the problem? Well, they rejected Jesus, so they rejected the prophecy as well. So if you, as we will discover as we read on through the book of Daniel, study it, that, that chapter 8, putting together chapters 8 and chapter 9 specifically prophesies when Jesus is to appear, the Messiah is to appear. And of course they rejected the Messiah, so they don't want people to read that. As a result, it's almost impossible to get the truth about God from traditional Judaism mm -hmm. since, since in the last 2,000 years. Because mm -hmm. they, re they rejected the, the truth. Mm -hmm. Well, many Christian scholars, by contrast, have looked at places like Hosea 3, 4, and 5, and just this way the people of Israel will have to live for a long time without kings or leaders, without sacrifice or sacred stone pillars, without idols or images to use for a divina divination. But the time will come when the people of Israel will once again turn to the Lord their God and to a descendant of David their king. Then they will fear the Lord and will receive his good gifts. Now, how is that? traditionally understood by our Christian friends. Many of them believe that Jesus is actually going to come down. He's going to establish a kingdom in, in Israel and people will flock to him and eventually everybody in the world will, will live righteous lives and there will be this wonderful millennium and so forth. And we could... Well, let me read a couple more. Look at, look at Amos 8, verse 11. The time is coming when I will send famine on the land. People will be hungry but not for bread. They will be thirsty, but not for water. They will hunger and thirst for a message from the Lord. I, the Sovereign Lord, have spoken. So when's that supposed to happen? Well, that's one of the questions. And then there's a couple of passages. Look, for example, Zechariah 14.4. At that time he will stand on the Mount of Olives to the east of Jerusalem. Then the Mount of Olives will split in two from east to west by a large valley. Half the mountain will move northwards and half of it southwards. Now, how do we understand that prophecy? When do we think that's uh, going to happen? Is that You're all supposed to be Daniel yeah. scholars by now, right? Well, is that when this... Um that's what happens at the third coming when the Holy Jerusalem comes down and, and, yeah. and that's where it will be located. So people have taken these things and they've worked with them like this and they've come up with all sorts of fanciful ideas and we'll talk about why we don't, excuse me, why we don't believe those interpretations. Well, they're talking about the third temple. 
yeah. right now that they're considering building yeah. the third temple. So is it clear in your mind out there that Hosea, Amos, and Zechariah are a different type of prophecy from the prophecies in Daniel? Well, one of the biggest problems in interpreting prophecies like the ones in the book of Daniel is the fact that many people approach scriptures with philosophical preconditions that force them to take different approaches. Consider the following. Preterism is an approach to interpreting all of Bible prophecies which limit the prophet and even God from predicting the future. So if you don't believe that even God can predict the future, what do you do with a book like the book of Daniel? Doesn't you, you, you've got some real challenges to try to figure out what you're going to do with it. So, all prophecies must be somehow be limited to applications which are in the act, right that happened in the very day of when the prophet was writing. Idealism is another approach. This was first suggested by the Catholic theologian Augustine. It teaches that apocalyptic prophecies are symbols of general spiritual realities without any specific historical time periods being involved. And then there's historicism, which by contrast holds that in apocalyptic prophecies, God reveals a panoramic sequence of history from the time of the prophet to the end of time. This view does not place limitations on God's foreknowledge. We believe that we can see in Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 11 prophecies that extended hundreds, even thousands of years beyond the times of Daniel himself. Why would God say to Daniel, seal up the book at the end? You know, it's not going to be understood till the time of the end. He's not talking about something that was happening in Daniel's day, right? Mm -mm. And of course, we Adventists would understand this was clearly what the Adventist pioneers taught, including Ellen White. Another very important aspect of understanding the book of Daniel is to realize that a prophetic day can mean a full calendar year. And there's a couple of verses in the uh, Bible that specifically mention that. Numbers 14, 34, talking about the time period that the, pro the spies spent uh, searching out the land of Canaan. You will suffer the consequences of your sin for 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you spent exploring the land. You will know what it means to have me against you from the Good News Bible. And then... Ezekiel 4, verses 5 and 6, when Ezekiel is supposed to be acting out some prophecies. When you finish that, turn over on your right side and suffer for the guilt of Judah for 40 days. One day for each year of their punishment. So, we, that we've got that idea from those verses and we, we're going to go and see how it applies. So, how can we be certain that we should use the day-year principle, or some people call it the year-day principle, when interpreting the prophecies of Daniel? Well, what are the other options? If you say, okay, we're going to take the 70-week prophecy just to mean 70 literal weeks, what happened after 70 weeks? How long would 70 weeks be? About a year and a half, right? Yeah, it doesn't fit. N nothing happened. Nothing like what it talks about in, in Daniel happened in 70, in 70 literal weeks. And if you come to Daniel 9, you talk about, so, so 70 weeks would be how many days? 490. 490. So if you now take a period of 490 years, what does it take you to? It leads down to the days of Jesus. Exactly, to the days of Jesus. And, and it's so, the arguments are so compelling that almost no Christian, at least, scholars, Question about the fact that, yeah, this is, this is the way they interpret it. But they don't want to follow on and you interpret the rest of the prophecies in light of that because why don't they want to use the day-year principle to talk about the 2300-day prophecy? Where does it take you to? Oh, 1844. It takes you to 1844 and who is that talking about? I was talking about Adventists, not the Seventh-day Adventist Church yet, but Adventists Advent. as a whole. The Advent movement was started with um, William, Miller. William Miller. So if you were willing to accept the fact that the God can predict the future 
and you carefully work out the timing of these things. And interestingly enough, God allowed certain events to take place. We'll talk about those in the future. That are, so we can nail these prophecies down exactly. We know down sometimes to the very day, but at least to the month and the year that things happened. And lo and behold, everything fits exactly. And you would think that with such an exact fulfillment, everybody would be saying, hallelujah, hooray, we got it all figured out. But the problem with that, of course, is if you do that, it takes you down and it says, okay, if you believe this, you come to 1844 and you need to accept the Advent movement and you need to accept the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, oh, oh, hold on. We're not sure we want to do that. So, let's talk about some of the prophecies that lead to that idea. We're just going to touch on them now. We'll, we'll go to them in much more de depth later. Uh, Jackie, I think you have one there. Daniel 8. It's Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay. And Dennis? Daniel nine twenty four to 27. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto uh, the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And that's from the King James Version. Right. And if you, if you look at a number of different versions, you read that text in a number of different versions, you will, you will see the unbelievable variation in the way they translate those, those verses. And partly that's because they're trying to figure out how to fit it in to what they think it's talking about. And many of the, the interpreters are going to try to fit that into the story that they know about the, the, the uh, Maccabees. And they're trying to cram it in there and stuff like this. But we're going to see that there are other ways to look at that. So there are still several things that we need to notice in this context. Margaret? Uh, since the visions are symbolic, the times indicated also must be symbolic. That's number one. Number two, as the events depicted in the visions unfold over long periods of time, even to the time of the end in some cases, the time spans related to these prophecies should be interpreted accordingly. So let me interrupt there for just a second. If you're, you're talking about prophecies that expand, extend to the time of the end, you can't be talking about a few weeks. That's just no. unthinkable. That's, yeah. Okay. And then number three, the year and day principle is confirmed by the book of Daniel. A clear example comes from the 70 week prophecy which extended from the days of Artaxerxes to the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. So the most obvious and correct way to make sense of the prophetic time periods given in the book of Daniel is to interpret them according to the year-day principle. And this is from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for January 1, 2020. So, if you accept this day-year principle, which... Uh, that was brought up by William Miller for, um, in the Adventist movement. We recognize that some of Daniel's prophecies extend 
2,300 years all the way down to 1844. There are three very important overarching lessons we need to learn from the book of Daniel. And we're going to repeat these because these are really important. We hope you all will get them. No matter how bad things might look at any given time, God is sovereign over events on this earth and our individual lives. Think of the stories of Joseph, Esther, and Daniel. Early in their lives, these young people experienced things that would have been considered to be terrible disasters to them. Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery. Esther lost her parents. Daniel was taken into Babylonian captivity. Yet each of these young people remained true and loyal to God and accomplished great things for God. So that's the first thing we, we're looking at there. Things may look pretty bad, but God will work through it. God is actively involved in directing the course of history, number two. It may seem like our world is controlled by human pride, greed, and desire for control of others, but Ellen White wrote, Carrie? In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appear as dependent on the will and prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of God, the curtain is drawn aside, and we behold behind, above, and through all the play and counterplay of human interests and power and passions, the agencies of the all-merciful one, silently, patiently working out the counsels of his own will. That's from uh, Education 173, Paragraph 2 by Ellen White. Okay, let's think about that for a moment. Let's just take a real quick look at Daniel 2. We know that there was that statue, and we have the Babylonian kingdom, we have the Medo-Persian kingdom, we have the Greek kingdom, we have the Roman kingdom, and how much, that's covering hundreds and hundreds of years. And then we come down and there's those, the, 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 the feet and toes of iron and clay. And how many years does that cover? We now know that covers quite a lot of years, all the way down, all of a sudden there's a stone coming out of the mountain. So basically it covers virtually the entire time period from Daniel's day to the, the, the second world. coming, the end of the world. So this, you, you can't, it can't be just something, you know, with a few weeks or even a few years. This is, this is an extensive, and we'll find out that these other prophecies are, are parallel in, in many ways. So now, let's just look at, a little more specifically at Daniel and his three companions. You think that they provide good role models for young people today? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Think yeah. about what happened to them. Remember, these were people who grew up, these young men grew up faithful in Jerusalem at a time when what was happening in Jerusalem? Siege. It was, well, yeah, it was about as corrupt as you could possibly imagine. And then the last three years, they were under siege. I mean, imagine that. And here is these young men who finally were captured and taken away to be some kind of ambassadors between the Jewish people and, and Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, uh, his, 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 his government. And yet, somehow or other, out of that terrible environment, when everybody else was was putting up uh, false gods in the temple and, and getting involved in fertility cult worship and so forth. Here were these faithful young men who went through all that and, and of course, ended up talking about, ending up being very faithful through all the experiences that uh, happened to them. So, um, even when their lives were threatened by being thrown into a burning fiery furnace or being thrown into a lion's den, they remained absolutely faithful to the God of heaven. And God stepped in and did what was necessary to make examples of them. Their behavior rocked empires. Think about it. Just think about the implications of that. Even when Daniel was confused and worried about some of the visions he had received, and remember at one time he received the vision, he says he couldn't understand it, and he, was, he was so worried about it, it made him sick. God was there watching over his child, and if we had time, well, let's, I, we can read, I think we can read a couple of these verses. Look at Daniel 9, 23. When you begin 
when you began to plead with God, now here, in Daniel 9, Daniel is praying to, to God to uh, try to explain things, to understand things. And the angel says to him, when you began to plead with God, he answered you. He loves you. And so I have come to tell you the answer. Now pay attention while I explain the vision. Wow. That's something. And look at verses, chapter 10, verses 11 and, and 12. The angel said to me, Daniel, God loves you. Stand up and listen carefully to what I'm going to say. I've been sent to you. When he had said this, I stood up, still trembling. Then he said, Daniel, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayers ever since the first day you decided to humble yourself in order to gain understanding. I have come to answer your prayer. Today we have the Bible, we have the writings of Ellen White, etc. But imagine what it would be like to, to have the experience of an angel literally coming to you and say, look, your prayers have affected the throne of God. And God has sent me down here to explain things to you. I don't know, I, that, that, that just bowls me over yeah. when I think about it. Well, of course, we'll talk more about that as, as time goes by. And of course, comparing Matthew 10, Jesus said, For only a penny you can buy two sparrows. You not, yet no one sparrow falls to the ground without your father's consent. As for you, even the hairs of your head have all been counted. So do not be afraid. You're worth much more than many sparrows. In fact, so Daniel has demonstrated that all heaven is paying attention to his prayer. So how would you feel about receiving such a, prayer, such a response from heaven to one of your prayers? But don't we? I mean, we get, we get that kind of response. We know that our, he's a good father to us. Mm -hmm. And so he hears our prayers and he answers them. We may not have the angel, but we can believe that he's taking care of business. Very and good. Yeah. So, Jim, yeah, you have some comments about that. I recommend that we study the history of Daniel and his fellows. Though living where they were, met the temptation to indulge self, they honored and glorified God in the daily life. They determined to avoid all evil. They refused to place themselves in the enemy's path. And with rich blessings, God rewarded their steadfast loyalty. Wow, that's in special... Ellen White manuscript release yeah number 224 so now let's be very specific about God's personal care and involvement in our individual lives God was able to think about this God was able to reach down into the mind of a pagan king and give him a vision slash dream about the future events in our world extending all the way down to the end of time think about that yeah then he was able to come and do the same thing, the same dream to Daniel, for Daniel, giving him also an interpretation of what he had seen. That is way beyond what even your psychiatrist can do, let me assure you. <laughs> I see Carrie smiling since he had many years of experience with that kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Are you happy that God is, that has that kind of intimate knowledge of your brain and your thinking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every thought. He's fully aware of every single thought. So, there are three points we want to make specifically clear in this lesson. One, the entire book of Daniel along with the rest of Scripture is focused on Jesus Christ. Jesus himself emphasized this point. Carrie, I think that was supposed to be yours. Was no. no? No? Okay. No, it's yours. I'm sorry. Apocalyptic, yeah, I'm, I'm correct. Apocalyptic literature aims at encouraging God's people in times of crisis and persecution by disclosing God's overarching plans for history and how it will all end. Evil will be eliminated and God's eternal kingdom will be established. There is no question about the final outcome. And think about the assurances we have as believers in Scripture who take this historicist approach we don't have any questions about how it's going to end. I mean, when we, when we might have some questions about details between now and then, but we know it's going to end with Jesus Christ coming in the yeah. clouds. Yeah. No question. Historicism, number three, is by far the best approach to understanding the prophecies of the Bible. 
It does not limit God's ability uh, to predict the future. More than that, it shows that God is carefully watching over his faithful people from the days of Adam and Eve right on through the second coming, the third coming in our future lives and eternity. As Ellen White has told us, Jackie? We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way that Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. What do you think she had in mind when she said that? Exactly we, what she said. Yeah. yeah. Pretty plain. How many people today are doing careful studies of the early history of the Adventist Church and all of God's behavior and all of his interventions, etc.? If you ask a young people in the Adventist Church today questions about the early history of the church, they don't know. They're on another they planet. It's it. shaky. Yeah. <clears throat> but there are a lot of young people that are as asking those questions. I hope and so. And are studying. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. We need but as many as possible. There's a number of books out on the various pioneers as well. Uh, yeah. More have been coming out over the years. So, One of the most enlightening things that ever happened to me was I... I have a computer system that will read anything that's in print. It'll read it to me. And so I recorded all the six-volume history of Ellen White. Oh, wow. In, in audio form. And I listened to it probably for a year, listening to those books as I ran every morning for an hour, oh, listening wow. to those books. It's an incredible experience to realize all the things that she went through. And, of course... Is, is her story, her life is, a, is basically a, a just in parallel with the history of our church. Unbelievable. So, let us summarize. What can we learn from the book of Daniel? The prophecies in Daniel. Uh, let's see here. Look here. The prophecies in Daniel through the redemptive historical progression of that book, all point to a final conclusion that when Jesus will be our Lord and King for eternity. Two, Jesus promised to be our Messiah, the one who called himself the Son of Man, first mentioned in Daniel 7 and 9. Many prophecies in the Bible are revealed in type and anti-type. In Daniel, Jesus is revealed in his role in the sanctuary as the priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Both Joseph and Daniel went through experiences that were analogous to the later experiences of Jesus Christ. Daniel's friends, for example, were expected to fall down and worship the golden image. Daniel 3, 5. Of course, they didn't, right? Which is similar in many respects to the devil's tempting of Jesus. All things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Matthew 4, verse 9. Even in the face of death, Daniel and his friends were obedient to their God, that was a foretaste of the perfect obedience of Jesus. So once again, what do we see here? There are very interesting parallels between these experiences in the Old Testament and the story of Jesus. Okay, notice these important particular elements about apocalyptic prophecy. Am I on that one? I'd be under... You're still... You're yeah, still. single fulfillment. Apocalyptic yeah. prophecy is unconditional yeah. and has one single fulfillment. It may have multiple similarities and homiletical applications, and of course we've all heard people preaching all kinds of things, which is appropriate. However, it points to a single fulfillment. For example, the second coming of Jesus Christ. This fulfillment is a logical consequence of the historicist approach. So let's think about that. When God says there's going to be Babylon... There's going to be Medo-Persia. There's going to be Greece. There's going to be Rome. And then there's going to be a bunch of smaller kingdoms, the less important kingdoms that didn't rule the world. And then there's going to be Jesus himself coming back and ruling for the rest of eternity. How much conditionality is there in that? Does it say, well, if you don't repent, this is what's going to happen? No. Nothing like that. God says, this is no. what's going to happen. And it happened. All, we've just got a little ways to go now. And recapitulation, which is a long way of saying that you repeat things. 
As we have already mentioned, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation have many repeat applications which are parallel in many respects. Daniel 2 is parallel in many ways to Daniel 7, 8, and 10 to 12. It has been suggested, for example, that Daniel 2 depicts the restoration of the kingdom. Daniel 7, the restoration of the king to his throne in, Dan in heaven. Daniel 8, the restoration of the sanctuary when it is cleansed. In Daniel 8 and Daniel 10 to 12, the restoration of God's people to their place in heaven. In order to nail down the most important fulfillment of a prophecy in a pop apocalyptic prophecy, it is necessary to apply the day year principle. You just can't get it to work out if you take any of it. I can tell you there are very famous commentaries on the book of Daniel that look at these things and say, well, these are, these are kind of like fairy tales, kind of like Jack and the Beanstalk or, you know, da da da. This is, these are just. You know, they, you know they, you, they don't have to fit anything particular. You just, they just teach us such important lessons. And you think, what in the world are those people thinking? The day your principle is, was not unique to Adventism. It goes way back to uh, the 300s. But and, uh, with, and some people have applied it in different prophecies and ways that we would not agree with. But... Uh, it's been used, if you just go to Wikipedia and, and yeah. put in uh, day, year, principle, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff about uh, But try to find used. that written in a commentary with someone from yeah. who's interpreting the book of Daniel. No, not going to find it. Historicism, which is essential to our understanding of Daniel Revelation, must be understood in contrast to preterism, idealism, and futurism, we believe that historicism is the correct way to understand apocalyptic prophecy for the following reasons. And Margaret, is that you? Nope. That's Dennis. That's me. Okay. First, historicism is the method suggested by the Bible itself. For example, the prophetic ch uh, chains of uh, Daniel 2, 7, 8, and 9 are explained from a his historist perspective, the sequence of the world empires that culminate in the establishment of God's kingdom span a time period extending from the Babylonian or Persian times to the end of the world. Second, the large time periods and the universal scope of uh, apocalyptic prophecies, 1260, 2300, 490 years, which span kingdoms and ultimately result in the kingdom of God can be better explained according to the historist uh, approach. Third, Jesus understood the future destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, uh, as to, he mentions in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, as a fulfillment of Daniel 9, uh, 26 and 27. Paul refers to a number of successive uh, prophetic events to be fulfilled within history before the second coming of Christ, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 12. Let me interrupt for just a second. And Jesus says, in quoting Daniel, these prophecies are still future. Right. So, so that means Daniel predicts what? Future, future events. Future events. Go yeah. ahead. And he's particularly in Daniel 24, he's, I mean, Matthew 24, he's talking about the uh, uh, abomination of desolation, but everybody wants to make that Antiochus Epiphanes work, yeah. and and yet that was before Jesus. So yeah. Jesus is applying the prophecy of Daniel to the future. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, let's see. Fourth. Am I on the third or the fourth? Oh, fourth. fourth yeah. Fourth. The historist uh, approach was used by the early church fathers and the reformers. Augustine began a shift in perspective when he qualified the kingdom of God with the, with the Christian church and the millennium with the Christian era. Fifth, the historist approach is based on the assumption that God works through the centuries of human history to bring the plan of salvation to its consummation. There are no gaps in God's redemptive activities in the scenario depicted in the apocalyptic prophecies. Adult teacher Sabbath school study guide, Sabbath school study guide. Um, page 16. Th page 16. And the reformers, I mean, it, it looks like it ended with Augustine, but he just had an influence. But yeah. 
the reformers all were, uh, most of all. Of them okay, were we've got just a couple minutes left. Let's see if we can finish off. Margaret? Okay, Seventh the Adventists believe that the histor his historic Isn't historicism is the right method of interpretation to be used in the interpretation of the books of Daniel and Revelation. The method is supported by the scriptures itself and was in use during the early church period. Moreover, they feel that in using this method, they are also preserving an important aspect of the reformer's work of restoration. This was Don F. Neufeld from the Seventh-day Adventist Encyclopedia. Okay. And there is need of a much closer study of the Word of God, especially should Daniel and Revelation have attention as never before. The light that Daniel received from God was given especially for these last days. Ellen White, Testimonies to Ministers. And Carrie, I think you have some words to add to that. Yes. When the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. And that came from Testimonies to Ministers, 114 page and paragraph 3. So I'm going to throw it out to you in the audience there. This is a, something I want you to think about. We've got a whole quarter to study just the book of Daniel. We, a few quarters back, we studied the book of Revelation. How does an understanding of these two books impact your entire religious experience? Is this some kind of magic or is this what what do we see in these two books specifically? And those of us here and those of you, of you out there probably recognize that Daniel and Revelation have been very important books in, in, in the teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And now here's the thing that says, if we really understand them quickly, correctly, we will have entirely different religious experiences. What does that mean? I want you to think about that while we work our way through this book of Daniel. So how should we understand the book of Daniel? Will we be able to put Christ into every aspect of our study? How does what happened to Jesus Christ has already been, we've hinted at it already, some of the things that happened to Jesus. How do they fit with what we read here in the book of Daniel? The Seventh-day Adventist movement really got its start from a study of the book of Daniel. And of course, that's the story of William Miller uh, back in the 1820s and 1830s. Are we prepared to do what he did and carry that torch forward? Are we really prepared to be Seventh-day Adventists? A kind of loving father. What a privilege it is to study your word and to see how these different uh, things all come together and fit in a wonderful way if we interpret them correctly so that we can come to understand you and come to respect you more as you control and, and, and really exercise your sovereign will over this earth because there's a goal to be reached and that goal will come soon, we believe. All these things we accept in the name of Jesus. Amen.